All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Chelsea Allinger. I'm the Executive Director of Greater Greater Washington. I'm really thrilled to see so many folks here today for this webinar on uh, fare free transit. I know we're welcoming people today from all over, not just the region, but even beyond. Uh, so looking forward to not just an engaging set of presentations, but also discussion with our audience as well. Um, I wanna say a quick thank you to Kate Gentoft Her, who is the um, the Gigi Wash ghost hiding hiding behind the panelist named Gigi Wash. She provides the technical support and assistance that makes this webinar happen. So thank you so much for that. And I want to thank our three panelists, our three speakers who are here with us today. We have Jane Lyons, who is the Maryland Advocacy Manager at the Coalition for Smarter Growth. Chris Laskowski, who's legislative director for DC council member Charles Allen, and Julie Tim, the CEO of the Greater Richmond Transit Company. And our moderator today will be Ron Thompson, who is the policy officer at Greater Greater Washington, and he also coordinates the DC Transportation Equity Network, which is a coalition of direct service nonprofits and advocacy organizations that work on trans transportation and transit equity issues in DC. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Ron, who will talk a little bit about what we're gonna cover um, in today's session uh, before, we, before we hand it off to the panelists. So, Ron. Thank you for that, uh, Chelsea. And uh, thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, as uh, Chelsea already uh, introduced, I want to start by thanking our panelists, uh, each um, from uh, uh, north to south, bringing a unique perspective on uh, what has been a very um, interesting uh, acceptance of a policy that was once hailed as uh, something that uh, do-gooder advocates simply wanted to do. It's, it's starting to be internalized by transit agencies. Um, as Chelsea said, my name is Ron Thompson. I'm policy officer here at Greater Greater Washington. And in my work, um, I manage uh, a network of DC-based uh, nonprofit organizations that work to provide uh, direct services, housing, healthcare, and also do advocacy um, on issues like uh, biking and, and the environment. Um, just very briefly, why this webinar is important to me and this topic is important to me, I began this work believing that public transit is a right, it's a service. Um, and I was one of the folks who simply said it should be free. And then I got into the world, the nitty gritty of bus planning and funding uh, public transit. And I learned also that in order to uh, make transit better for its core ridership, those transit first riders, I like to call them, um, we have to do a lot more than simply make transit free. And that's what today's conversation in part is about. But we're also going to talk about why fare elimination and reduction initiatives across the country and in our region have, um, went, have gone from a position simply held by advocates to one that transit agencies uh, and elected officials are accepting as, as reasonable and things that we can do. So that being said, um, I want to be, I want to get right into our program uh, today. As I said, thank you all for joining us. Um, I want to first introduce our uh, first panelist, uh, Jane Lyons, who works as a male and advocacy manager for the Coalition for Smarter Growth. And, and Jane is going to talk to us about uh, Montgomery County's uh, Fair Free uh, Bus Pilot Program. And I turn it over to you, Jane. All right, well, thank you so much for having me here uh, this afternoon to talk about free bus service in Montgomery County. Can you all see my slides? All right, um, so here we go. I have the joy of, of kicking this off, so <laughs> bear with me. All right, Fair Free Ride On um, in Montgomery County. Just to start, for those of you who might not be super familiar with Montgomery County, um, we're to the north of Washington, D.C. 
um, large jurisdiction that includes very urban places, very suburban places, and very rural places. Um, and ride on, depending on how you measure it, is the largest suburban bus system in the United States by ridership, or at least it was before the pandemic. Um, all of these uh, data points that I'm sharing here are from before 2020. Uh, right on had a daily ridership of 85,000, 80 routes. Um, budget fair revenue was about 20 million. Um, most of the operating funding came from local funds, about 50%. Um, which is funded by the mass transit property tax, mostly, um, and then state aid making up about 30% of that. Um, for capital side of funding of Ride-On, about 70% local, 30% federal. Uh, and Ride-On um, has been around for quite a while, but has not seen a comprehensive route redesign in over 30 years, which will be important later. I will talk about that. Um, and here to the right is um, a chart just showing that before the pandemic, Ride-On's ridership was already decreasing. This is not something that is unique to Ride-On at all. This is something that was being felt and happening to um, bus systems all over the country. Ride-On offers four different types of services. Um, Ride on uh, the one second to the left here, the light blue buses that you can see in my background picture here. <laughs> um, this is their, their normal um, service, fixed route service. Ride on extra is express route. Um, I believe at this point there's only one ride on extra route in operation, the 101 that goes up and down Rockville Pike, Maryland 355 and it offers limited stop service, but isn't quite to the degree of all the amenities that something like bus rapid transit is supposed to offer. That is more akin to the flash service, which runs uh, along US 29 Colesville Road in the Eastern part of the county. Um, that opened, I believe, August, 2020. Time is all running together. It was definitely in August. I believe it was 2020. Um, and there is a plan for a lot more um, of these routes, of these flash routes all over the county. I will hesitate to call it bus rapid transit because it does not have a dedicated lane, especially in the most congested areas. And as a lot of us know, that's what's most important in making bus rapid transit rapid, but it does offer higher quality of service, lawn articulated buses, Wi-Fi, um, fancier bus stations where you pay off board. And then finally, there's Ride on Flex, which is um, on demand service that is operating in a pilot capacity around the Rockville area and then the Wheaton uh, Glenmont area. Um, so that is a relatively newer service that I've heard has been pretty successful. Here, I will not dwell on this, but this is just to show you a little bit of an overwhelming image about how much. Um, ride on covers um, and also how difficult this is to understand if you are a rider and you want to look at a bus map but um, the point here is that ride on covers a lot of a lot of space and who rides ride on uh, recently as I'll talk about a little bit later Montgomery County did a fair equity study and they found that the median income of, of a ride on rider is $35,000 and that compares to $108,000 of the county median. So significantly lower income than the rest of the county. Over 80% are people of color, although that's a statistic for the general DC region. And it's estimated that it costs about $1,248 annually to ride on a regular basis. Um, and so this graphic here is from that fair equity study that the county did showing how ride on customers compared to county households overall. Um, and you can see there that as incomes go up, it's much less likely that somebody is going to be using ride on services. And as incomes go down, it's much more likely that somebody is going to be using ride on. So before the pandemic happened, there were several existing ride on programs that offered free service. Um, the first one happened I believe it was 2019 or so, like right before 2020, the Kids Ride Free program where all students in Montgomery County were able to ride free, saw a 57% increase in student riderships over the first six months. So that was a case of really getting ridership gains from that program. Um, seniors and people with disabilities were able to ride for free during certain times of day on certain days of the week. But as of last year, 
due to the advocacy that we did, that is now permanent. And then there's also a free circulator in downtown Silver Spring. And our argument has been the ride-on can really hit a sweet spot between systems that are too big to, to publicly cover fare box costs where it'd be really, really expensive. And also there's such a high um, uh, existing ridership that to handle even more would be a lot. And that's really systems like think of Chicago or New York. And then between systems that are small enough to cover fare box, box costs because they don't really have a ton of ridership, um, but they also don't really have the service quality needed to attract many new riders. And this is what I think we see in a lot of smaller cities and towns that are going fare free. Ride on offers pretty good service, although it needs to be a lot better and has pretty significant ridership. So what we're pitching is that ride on can really hit this sweet spot in between. And just to talk briefly about what are the benefits of free fares, I know we'll dig into this a little bit more. Um, equity, definitely. Anytime you're decreasing fares, it's going to overwhelmingly benefit um, lower income folks and people of color. Economic development, um, a lot of the research points to that there's an offset. Um, it, it's, of course, costly to have free fares, but there's an offset of increased economic activity. And then where it's a little bit more tricky is that if you want more ridership, um, and then thus the climate benefits of getting people out of cars. Um, my understanding of reading the literature is that there's not as much support there, but there's still a lot more research that needs to be done. Um, and it can really depend on the system. Uh, it seems from existing research that the gains mostly come from people who are already not riding or using cars, people who are walking or biking and low income neighborhoods. Um, and so this looks like a lot of data but this is the results from Montgomery County's fair equity study. You can see the boxes I've highlighted in red. They looked at four scenarios. The first one was zero fares for everyone. Alternative C was half fare for all, which is what the county executive ended up recommending. Um, you can see that zero fares offer the highest equity benefits. Um, it offers the basically double the ridership benefits, double the reduction in vehicle miles traveled, which is, of course, important for climate policy. Um, and you can see the cost differences there as well. Um, but I definitely wanna say free fares alone are not enough. Both free fares and service improvements together would result in the most benefits. This is a chart that I put together back in uh, 2020, I believe, of basically just seeing, is there an association between frequency and ridership for ride on? The answer is yes. Um, over the past year, I've put, or past two years now, I have been organizing the Montgomery County Better Buses Coalition. We're a group of about 30 organizations um, that represent labor, service providers, transit advocates, climate advocates, who have come together to create a platform. This is not supposed to be something that you can actually read, but feel free um, after this to uh, go and take a look at it a platform about what we want to see improved. And this includes free fares, but it also includes a lot of other things. You can see their service improvements, upgrading bus stops, revamping wayfinding. There's a lot that we need to do. And this is just a brief timeline of what has been happening in Montgomery County with free fares. Started in 2020 due to the pandemic. You can see here, basically the main takeaway is that we kept winning extensions and asking for the county to extend these emergency free fares. Um, and the county did the fair equity study as a part of this to help them decide whether or not to go permanently free. That decision still hasn't been made. Um, but right now, free fares are supposed to go until July 2022. Um, which basically gives them this budget cycle that's happening right now this spring to decide what's what will happen. And us, the Better, Bus Better, Better Buses Coalition, are asking for the county council to formally extend free fares until the ride-on reimagined study is complete, which is what will essentially redesign all the ride-on and metro bus routes in the county and look comprehensively at how can we make bus service better. And so we're asking not necessarily to make fares free permanently now, but at least extend it to them so that we can really figure out what is the best use of funds. So I will stop sharing there. Um, I may have gone a little bit over time, but thank you for indulging me. Thank you for that presentation. And I realize Jane works on so much. Uh, she talked about some of it. And I want to share that with folks in her work outside of transportation at uh, the Coalition for Smarter Growth is in her work as man uh, Maryland Advocacy Manager. Um, she's organized around better housing and land use policy. 
And she comes uh, with a very rich experience, including um, working for the EPA Smart Growth Program at the Maryland General Assembly, at the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, and for the Montgomery County Council. Uh, she uh, has a master of public policy with specialization in city management and public finance, and a BA in economics, both from the University of Maryland College Park. And she lives in Silver Spring now. So thank you for that presentation. Jane. We're now going to hear from uh, our, uh, Jane's neighbor to the south, uh, Chris Laskowski, who has been DC Council Member Charles Allen's legislative director since 2017, covering a broad range of issues from transportation and environment to education, affordable housing, small business, and taxation. He also staffs Council Member Allen um, in his regional roles uh, at, on the Transportation Planning Board and the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments. Prior to coming to Council Mary Allen's office, Chris was a project director at DC Appleseed Center for Law and Justice, working on issues ranging from DC voting rights to Anacostia River rest restoration to HIV and AIDS policy. Chris has also served as an environmental policy analyst at the, Uni the United States Embassy in Moscow and a third grade teacher in the Baltimore City Public School System. He's a graduate of the George Washington University Law School, the, John Hopkins, the Johns Hopkins University School of Education, and the University of Michigan. And with that, I turn it over to Chris. Uh, well, thank you, Ron. And uh, thanks, uh, Gigi Wash, for putting this together and, and, and everyone who's here today. Uh, I'm going to try to keep my presentation as short as possible because I don't have a nice slideshow like everyone else. So I will try to uh, spare you just looking and, and, at, and listening to me. Um, as much as possible. Uh, but I'm here to talk about uh, Councilmember Allen's legislation, uh, the Metro for DC Amendment Act of, I believe we're at 2021 now. Um, this idea sort of originated uh, back in 2019, and we introduced a version of the bill in February of 2020, um, followed immediately, uh, I think about two weeks after we had a press conference and, and released it, um, obviously, things changed quite a bit in, in our world. And so this, uh, we put the idea on hold for a little bit, but, but um, view it as an important part of uh, the district's recovery and, and, and really regional recovery in the transit system. So Metro for DC uh, legislation will do, um, there's kind of two, two main pieces to the legislation itself. One is it will create a subsidy for district residents of up to $100 per month um, that can be used on anywhere that, that takes a smart trip card. Um, and that, that subsidy is, is set up such that um, you can use up to $100 a month, but you don't get $100 a month. Um, it would the, the uh, amount on your smart trip card would be refilled up to $100. So if you don't use anything in a particular month, you don't get any new money the additional month. And the next month, this isn't something that would accumulate over time. This um, It would be refilled based on, on, on usage. Um, and then the other big pillar of the bill um, is a what we're calling the Transit Equity Fund, um, which we're proposing, at least in the bills introduced, would be $10 million annually that would be used to improve service um, uh, a bus service for, for folks in the district who are particularly dependent on transit. So this, this kind of came out of, um, as Ron mentioned earlier, some discussions, again, 2018, 2019 sort of timeline, um, where folks were talking about just making transit free and, and making buses free in particular. Um, in Kansas City, for example, they uh, just took fare boxes out or removed, removed or uh, abolish fares completely on, on, on their buses. Um, and we went, when we went to look at that, we said that's a great idea um, and looked at it in a little more detail and realized in Kansas City, the cost was in somewhere in like the single digit millions um, to do this. Uh, and then when we started looking to compare that to fare revenue data for WMATA, um, uh, the idea of making buses completely free uh, was not something that we could, uh, we could probably fund through, through local funding at, at the council um, or in, in, in DC. Uh, so what we decided, what, what we looked at actually was a model that originally came from uh, a transit benefit that uh, DC council staff uh, have access to, which is, um, again, you determine the amount um, that, you, that you can, uh, that you use each month on transit up to $100. And then that amount is refilled based on, on what you use each month. And we said, well, why can't we extend this to the rest of uh, the district, rest of uh, district residents? Um, and 
uh, I kind of had two goals for this. So one is is to, in, in we were hoping to encourage um, uh, more use of, of transit, but more so to to make this to make it make transit more affordable for people who really especially rely on transit. Um, I'm sure a lot of the folks in the audience know the research that tr transportation cost burdens um, are much higher uh, the lower your income is. And um, that's especially true in the district. Uh, folks who are less likely to own a car are folks who live in Ward 7 and 8, um, predominantly Black uh, district residents. And they have the longest commutes. They have the most expensive commutes. They live the furthest from, from job centers. And so uh, providing, providing this kind of subsidy would be uh, a way to make transit more affordable for, um, for folks who need to get to work. Um, and but we're we're also hoping through this that we we could induce um, a few few more people to get out of their cars. Now, as uh, James sort of mentioned, the research on that is not um, it, it tends it tends to be that if you reduce fares or you give folks a greater subsidy, it will be that folks who already use transit will use it a little bit more. Um, and in particular, there's research for low income riders um, that says that finds that they will um, do things like go to the doctor, um, engage with um, social services that they might have otherwise not um, because they just couldn't afford it. And so th those are really important goals. So um, uh, I think all, all of that, all of that was kind of in our mind. And as we started talking to folks, um, uh, we, as again, I think Ron and a couple other people have mentioned, uh, just just reducing fares um, is often not enough to encourage folks to to either get onto transit in the first place or to to um, use transit more than, than they already do. Uh, it really it comes down to making transit um, more convenient um, and, uh, and something that, that fits, fits their needs. So the second, that's kind of where that, the second piece of the, this transit equity fund came from, um, where we wanted to really focus on uh, bus in, in particular. And the reason we want to do that, again, as we go back to um, the folks who rely on transit, especially in the district, um, that is that are, those are really uh, bus riders, and we saw that during the pandemic. Um, uh, sort of the first summer of the pandemic, Metro Rail ridership was down ninety percent or more, um, but Metro Bus ridership, though it was down, was only down maybe around sixty percent, and that's because the folks who ride the bus, as we all know, are uh, those essential workers who didn't have the opportunity to to uh, work remotely um, and had to find a way to get to work and they didn't have a car didn't have another way to get there so they were continuing to ride the bus um, we see we've gotten data from metro that suggests 80% uh, of bus riders um, are people of color as James suggested regionally um, about 50% of uh, metro bus riders um, live in households with uh, income of $30,000 or less per year, and about 60% do not have access to a car. Uh, and if you compare that to Metro Rail ridership, um, Metro Rail ridership is majority white, and almost half of Metro Rail riders make more than $100,000 annually. Um, so when we set up this transit equity fund, we said we need to focus on the bus uh, or bus, bus, bus service. Um, so the things that, that this fund could be spent on are um, range from bus shelters, um, you know, could be uh, kiosks to to purchase uh, Metro uh, a smart trip card at a, at a bus stop, could be uh, other infrastructure to make it easier to pay for, for Metro um, bus, but it could also be to um, to provide increased uh, service to add, um, add uh, additions to, to an existing bus line in the district um, or to increase um, increase service, uh, reduce reduce headways on for buses. So in the district, again, as, as many of you all know, um, the district and through through DDOT funds uh, non regional bus lines. So those are our bus lines that operate only in the district. Those are funded directly through DDOT. So we have an opportunity and we have the council has in the past um, given money directly to to improve service or to increase service on on those non regional bus lines. So um, that's where we want to focus. I know there may be some discussion um, a little bit later on uh, whether we want to limit that that subsidy to non regional lines and get into regional lines. I think we can maybe have that discussion later. Um, but but the um, the reason we, we, we did that in, in the bill and as introduced is because the district has the most direct control over, over where funding goes for um, non-regional buses. Um, but also in the district, we have the circulator lines um, that again are completely uh, uh, 
where, where we, we have complete control over how money is spent and how services is, is, is offered. So that's, that the DC circulator service could also be um, another area where that transit equity fund could be used to, um, to improve service. So between the two, we want to make it easier, uh, cheaper, uh, more, more affordable for, for folks who rely on transit to use transit, um, to encourage them to use transit more, to um, uh, make it easier for them to get to work. Um, but we also want to, we also um, understand that that means also making service better, um, which is also part of the reason why when we thought about this, we thought about this as a subsidy that we we're gonna give to riders, right? We're not gonna give, we, we're not gonna give a direct subsidy to, to um, WMATA, to increase service or to change service or otherwise support WMATA directly, but we're gonna give it to riders and say, okay, WMATA, if you can deliver service that these riders want, they have, we're gonna, they have money that they can, they can spend um, on your service. Um, so hoping that this will be an inducement to, um, to WMATA to uh, capture those, those riders who now have more, more uh, fair revenue to spend. Um, and we do believe that ultimately it will be, um, it will be a net benefit uh, to fair fair revenue for for WMATA um, coming out of the pandemic, which, uh, as we know, is going to be extremely important. Um, with uh, WMATA facing a, a huge budget gap that may not always be um, filled in by the federal government going forward, um, it's WMATA is really the backbone of, of a lot of our regional economy, getting folks to work, getting folks to businesses, um, and moving folks around around the region. Uh, in a way that that um, you know is is aligned with our climate goals to to reduce um, reduce vehicle miles traveled um, and uh, and uh, get more get more people out, out of single occupancy vehicles. So um, the last thing I want to touch on just real briefly is the funding mechanism. Now, how much is this going to cost? Um, and the short answer is a lot, uh, but we think it we think it's we think it's an important and worthwhile um, proposal for. All the reasons I, I just I just uh, just mentioned, um, and so the way we have we we have talked about this, and again happy to get into this a little bit a little bit more um, is uh, is by um, funding this as as the district's revenue grows naturally. This would be a priority that we would fund, where we would not be talking about raising taxes um, or otherwise increasing fees on anyone to to fund this directly. Um, and I will share a screen here and just give folks a little bit of an example of, okay. So here we will see um, every, uh, every quarter, uh, our, uh, the district's uh, chief financial officer um, provides a updated revenue estimate. Um, so every year when, we, when we, the council passes a budget for the district, we do that based on the amount of, of revenue that that the CFO um, projects we will collect that year, and then we 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 um, budget four years out as well. So the, our budget for four years is based on the amount of money that the CFO uh, believes we'll bring in 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 the following year. So what we want to tap into is every quarter um, the CFO updates that that estimate and pre-pandemic, and then again over the last year or so, that's meant a lot of additional money. Um, that uh, additional revenue for the district that is not captured in our budget because we didn't know about that money when the council approved the budget. So if we look down here um, at this line down here where it says revenue change from previous year. So this is our February revenue estimate. We'll see um, FY21 includes some, some one-time money that is um, from, uh, that, that's, that's, that's money that came in during, during fiscal year 21, which is over now. And that wasn't spent. But the important numbers is we, we look forward here. We talk, we look at fiscal year 2022, 2023, 2024, 2025. The revenue that we have now is a lot, we have a lot more revenue now than we thought we did when we first passed a budget. And that money is just sitting there unspent. So what our legislation would do was would be to say, we want we're gonna prioritize that money to fund this subsidy for district residents. And we believe that this this amounts here. Um, you'll see these are at least $250 million in new revenue per year um, that's kind of sitting there unspent. Um, that's more than enough to, we believe that's, that's more than enough to, to cover the cost of, of this program. Um, and so the legislation would just 
put into place a, a, a priority for for the district that that's where we're going to spend um, additional revenue as our economy grows. We'll share that with our res residents through this subsidy. Um, so I'll end there. Uh, again, thanks thanks very much, and look forward to the discussion and look forward to um, hearing everyone's presentations. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, and we're going to our last our last presentation is from the CEO of the Greater Richmond Transit Company, uh, Julie Tim. In September 2019, Julie moved to Richmond, Virginia and began as GRTC's sixth CEO and first female CEO in company history. Julie brings 25 years of experience in customer-focused strategic planning and the management of widely diverse transportation projects in the local, state, and federal arenas. She returned to Virginia from Tennessee, where she served uh, the prior three years as the Chief Development Officer of the Nashville Metropolitan Transit Authority and Regional Transport Authority, Transportation Authority of Middle Tennessee, rebranded as We Go Public Transport, Transit. A native of the Hampton Roads region of Virginia, Tim previously worked as the Transit Development Officer for Hampton Roads Transit from 2012 to 2016. From 2000 through 2012, she worked in private consulting firms for Maryland, located in Raleigh, North Carolina, where she advanced transportation projects and initiatives for high-speed rail, light rail, freight rail, highways, roads, and ports across the country. Julie holds a Master of Science and a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Old Dominion University and a Master of Business Administration from Vanderbilt University. And beyond her professional life, Julie is a full-time single mother to a 17-year-old, a 15-year-old foster daughter, four rescue cats, and a rescue dog. And she's taking time out of her busy schedule uh, doing all that to talk about the amazing uh, GRTC Fair British. So I turn it over to you, Julie. Um, thank you so much. I, that was long. Uh, I, you'll see me scrambling a little bit. Our power just went off. So I lost everything on my screen and had to bring it back up. So if you saw me uh, scrambling here, I'm trying to make sure you got it. So I think you should see the screen. Is that are we good? Awesome. I'll keep this uh, for those of you who have seen me speak before or heard me speak before. A lot of these slides are going to be uh, repetitive. You've seen them before, but the message is as true when I first started talking about this as it is now uh, truer even. I think that some of the things that you you heard, I'm going to try to not repeat. There is a very, very strong case for equity in transportation when we look at zero fares. There's also a very strong case for the environmental impacts of going zero fare and how it opens up those resources to put things into um, uh, stronger ride sharing mo uh, modes. What I think I'd like to try and focus on is the economic. Um, am I not in slideshow mode? Not yet, doesn't, um, not yet slideshow mode. <laughs> ah, I'm glad that I saw that. Uh, let me try that again. PowerPoint, share. Are you seeing the slide? It says cost. There we go. Great. Nice, thank you. This is why I'm not the director of IT. Um, so uh, at least I have unmuted. It's taken me two and a half years to figure out how to unmute myself. Some people wish I would go back to mute whole different topic. Point being is that there's a whole economic case for this. Um, I think that I, I'm going to see if I can focus on that for this presentation. And I'm going to go through a lot of these slides very, very quickly because many of you have seen them before. If I can figure out how to advance my slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, so very quickly. GRTC, uh, we are we serve a region of about 1.3 million. If you include, if you look at the RBA region, but primarily our services in Richmond and in RICO, we have a, a service area of about $500,000. We do local bus, uh, commuter bus, bus rapid transit, paratransit, van pool. Uh, you saw slides before that talked about the decrease in transit ridership from the early 2010s down to 2018, um, and that was a national trend. In 2018, however, GRTC reversed that trend, which was unheard of uh, in the transit community across the country. And they reversed that trend by implementing a network redesign and by implementing the pulse. And those two actions together realigned our system to be able to focus on getting people effectively between where they lived and their work. Um, we were, based on that increase in ridership, we were actually projecting to see about 10 million trips in 2020 20, um, before COVID hit. 
And um, we were all getting additional money regionally to be able to expand beyond that based to build on the success of that redesign. Now, when we look at transit and we look at the equity and the, uh, the, the, of transit, one of the things that we look at in the economy of transit is what exactly is it that mobility should be doing? Mobility connects people between their homes and their jobs, between their homes and their healthcare, uh, education, food, shopping. GRTC and transit does the same. We connect people between all of those services. However, transit tends to focus primarily or in the past on getting people between uh, housing and jobs and get getting the workforce to get to their jobs and back again. Um, I'm gonna come back to that in, a, in a, a bit, but I think that when you look at our network redesign, you look at the pulse, we did exactly that here at GRTC. The strategy was effective in connecting people between uh, where they lived and where they worked. The majority of our riders were going to and from work, some that were doing some others, and most of the people that were using transit lived within a few blocks of those transit lines. And then comes COVID, and that puts a, a kind of a spin on how effective that 2018 service design was. Um, we did not see the ridership drop that people across the country saw in transit. Our ridership drop, when you break it up by mode, yeah, we had that 93% drop in ridership on our express route. So those are the people that could telework. Those are white collar workers, uh, downtown workers, university students, um, state workers. The BRT uh, had a strong uh, ridership with university. And when they shut down, we saw that drop. But really, our local bus service only dropped by about 22%. And we started doing some more analysis around why is it that our local riders at this height of COVID, when everyone's telling, being told to stay home, they're still riding our buses. And yes, we went zero fare. Are they free? Are they just going around and enjoy riding? I, I, that didn't make sense. We looked at some more analysis and this is a wonky slide, but that first set, the, the blue, green, and gray really is, is separated into three different categories of COVID. Uh, the blue is July, 2019. That's when uh, pre-COVID, so that's our baseline that we're going to compare everything to. A year later, July 2020 is when we started seeing testing for COVID co come out. Uh, people could now get testing to see whether or not they had COVID. It wasn't great, it wasn't easy, but it was out there. And then July 2021 is about the time that vaccines became widely available to, um, to transit workers. It took a while for it to come out and there was still some upscaling of, of other people being getting access to it, but that's where we sat. If you compare that to data that we had from 2019 pre-COVID of who was riding, what were the demographics, what were the household incomes, and how were they paying for it? What we see is that um, the majority of people who were using that express uh, ridership, that green bar, the very, very, very far bar, the very, very tiny one that says express, it's mostly green. What that's telling you is that express riders weren't paying for their transit rides anyway they were getting uh, their rides paid for through their their employer pass or their university pass or their vcu pass they also had very high incomes when you look at some of those bars um, and those are the ones that when COVID hit dropped out of transit market when you look at the middle bars on each of those what you see is that they are predominantly lower income employees these are people who stocked our shelves at the grocery store because we still had to have groceries. These are the people that cleaned the dishes at the restaurants when we had a DoorDash bring us our food. These are the people that cleaned the floors at the hospitals where we were going to get ourselves cured or fixed from everything from our normal sicknesses to the overflow of the COVID vaccine. These are people who literally could not stay home. They had to work and zero fares allowed them to continue to access their jobs. So our system redesign was clearly a success. But the question then becomes, why did, how did our service come back to pre-pandemic levels, which is where it's at now, when we still see everyone teleworking? And the answer is that the people who were using transit that were our essential workforce, when the barrier of fares was removed, they were able to use transit more to get to healthcare, to get food, to get their prescriptions, even just to go to the park because recreation is a key determinant to someone's health. When we looked at uh, further uh, evidence that showed that that was true, when we looked at the overlapping of where we had ridership during the height of the pandemic, the early stages of it, where ridership continued to be 30 people on a bus, that's a lot of people on a bus when you're trying to social distance. 
and where they were coming from and going to, there's a very, very strong correlation that we designed the system right. We connected the essential workforce to jobs and we kept the economy going through zero fares um, based on where they lived and where they were working. Uh, so economically, we protected not just the region's economy by keeping the workforce, the essential workforce connected to their jobs, we also protected the individual essential workforce, their households, by making sure that they were able to continue to have a living and increase their access to health care, increase their access to food, increase their access. And the second that barrier to transportation, that barrier to access was removed, people used it. Now we had questions, do we have more homeless? Do we have more juvenile delinquents? Those are things that, yeah, we had a little bit more of that, but more perception than reality. And we also were able to limit it by saying, you can't, just because transit's free doesn't mean you get a free ride all day. You, you get a round trip, you go to where your destination is and then you have to move on. Did they go from bus to bus? Some, but the majority of our ridership were essential workers who now had a access that they didn't have before. And when they didn't have access to childcare um, and they had to take care of their kids because all the childcare places were closed, they can now work and keep their kids. They didn't lose their kids to foster care. They didn't lose their jobs. They didn't lose their health. They could have that access. And the money that they saved on fares went directly back into supporting their household. Now the question then becomes the cost. How much did this cost to actually do? We did a full analysis of it costs a, a million to $2 million for us to collect fares. Um, and when you stop having to collect those fares, we had a net uh, deficit of about $5 million. Well, we were collecting four to $5 million specifically from our low income um, community members. Removing collecting fares didn't impact people who weren't using transit. It didn't impact people who had their university pass, but it made all the impact on people who were paying cash who are paying daily and we're paying the most regressive form of the fares are low income employees. Um, so it just made economic sense to be able to find that. And when we talked to our community partners and our business partners and our university partners, um, and we started showing them the economic case for this, we have the chambers and the universities and our institutions. Um, while there is some, some hesitancy from some, a lot of them are coming forward and providing new mechanisms to support ongoing zero fares, even at the state level, to continue this experiment to see how it will increase our economy by signaling to our local workforce and signaling to our uh, regional and our national uh, labor pool and um, employers that this is the place where we do value our workers and we do support them and we support building their wealth and protecting their wealth um, it's a place to come and put your business. And when we have more ridership and we have more businesses, then we can fight for the more money to put more service out, to have a growth cycle, a wealth cycle, an economic cycle. It's a lot easier to fight for money for more transit when you have fuller buses and zero fares puts those fuller buses out there so that I can fight for that more money to put the expansion out, to put the frequency out so that others who might not need it can now use it. And now we have the economic or sorry, the environmental and impacts then follow on. So I'm gonna stop there because there's a lot um, to unpack. And I know that there are so many questions that we wanna to get to. So I'm gonna stop right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. Um, and I think that, that to end on that note, it's so, so very important. And uh, I, I, we are almost over time. So I'm gonna blend, I'm gonna do a kind of hybrid version of uh, questions from the audience uh, and try to get to as many of those as possible. Some of those questions were uh, my own questions. And I wanna begin with one of those questions from the audience uh, that uh, are very, very similar to what essentially is the uh, question I prepared for. Um, and I have to find it. Give me one second, bear with me folks, we're in our Q and A. Uh, Jacob Wasserman asks, have these analysis examined potential for reduced uh, interactions and possible escalation between law, uh, law uh, and fair enforcement riders, especially riders of color from fare free transit? And um, I, 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 that question is to all of our panelists, but I um, want to begin with you. Um, and I guess if I, I maybe read that too fast, I'm going to ask a different version of, this, I think, the same question. 
Where does fair evasion and its decriminalization fit into this conversation around fairless transit? Okay, and were you saying, were you focusing me first? Yes, you first. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, there, there's, a, there's been a lot of controversy over uh, fair enforcement across the country and, uh, and fair collection and how it, it focuses on um, uh, particularly uh, urban people of color and, and urban poor. Um, I don't have a lot of analysis on that specifically, but when you're, I do know that when we look at fair enforcement on our buses, um, the, the biggest issue with fair enforcement was at the fare box and trying to de-escalate and create less violence on the buses. And uh, when you don't have that at the fare box, it actually reduces that pressure and that burden on our operators and on our riders and on any uh, security or safety. So you actually take away a lot of that burden and make it a, um, a, a more peaceful and fair way to ride, no pun intended. Uh, we did have to deal with fair enforcement on the pulse because it was a proof of payment. And what we found is that it's just not effective um, unless you have people out there uh, with, with guns and the authority to enforce it. If you just have someone saying that, well, it, it's you're spending money to do nothing. Mm. I, I, that's not politically correct. I apologize. But I, I, that was one of the things I was asked to come to correct at GRTC. And our fair enforcement policy spent half a million dollars a year um, to do something that was really ineffective. <laughs> And, and that's important. Chris, uh, uh, Councilman Allen um, kind of led DC's effort to uh, decriminalize fare evasion. Um, and Metro Transit Police was very much in arms about this. Uh, can you talk a bit about uh, how that how that came to be that we did decriminalize fare evasion in, in the district? Yeah. Um, so I, I, I mean, as um, I guess I'll start by saying that I think we have generally been skeptical about some of the data that um, WMATA has provided as to the um, pervasiveness of fare evasion. Um, there's, uh, I think anyone on here who's, who's ridden, who rides the bus uh, regularly has gotten on the bus and had the driver said, ah, oh, fare box is broken, just get on, just get on. And I, I think our understanding is that's generally counted in those fare evasion numbers. Um, there's there's a, a lot of folks who who um, who, but 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 more, but more more specifically, um, fare evasion is to the extent that it exists is, is and it is a crime is is really um, is really has to do with with ability to pay right folks folks who are who are getting on a bus or getting on on metro rail and not paying it's because they can't afford to um and so that's that's another reason why why we we wanted to focus our our benefit on um giving a giving a a subsidy to folks who are going to ride transit right um to allow them to to be able to afford to take the trips that they that they need to take um and uh, you know, as we were going through the fair um, evasion decriminalization, um, I, I don't, I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but an overwhelming uh, percentage of the folks who are who are stopped or arrested for fair evasion uh, were black, and um, and the stations with the highest fair evasion rates are um, stations with where the surrounding population has the lowest incomes. Um, so. It's it's it, it's an issue of people being able to afford to ride transit. Um, I, I think that's pretty plain and simple. Um, and so, I think if you reduce fares, obviously you you have you allow folks to get to where they need to go without having to um, uh, run the risk of, of of that being a criminal action. Shane, I'm going to come to you on this question. This question, I'm going to get to another one. Uh, uh, that uh, that I, another question for all our fans, and I'll start with you. But on this one, with fair evasion, as I say it, the district as of right now is the only in the in the the, the Wamata compact area. So that's uh, the, the the counties in Northern Virginia and Southern Maryland and the district that make up uh, our metro system. Um, DC is the only jurisdiction so far that has embraced. Uh, fair evasion decriminalization. Do you have any insight on to, you know, why has it been so difficult in Maryland to get us to that point? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not entirely sure why it's been so difficult, and I think that that's something that I would imagine the Montgomery County would be open to embracing, but that hasn't been 
too big of a part of the conversation. So that's certainly something that I am jotting down to start raising and thinking more about. Um, but on to the question more generally about why this is important, we have several bus operators uh, who are a part of the Better Buses Coalition, including the labor union that represents bus operators. And part of the reason why they're really excited about free fares is exactly what Julia was talking about, is that it results in so many fewer abusive, violent interactions with riders, which unfortunately happens. Um, and bus operators already have such an incredibly difficult job that not having to enforce fares really decreases those altercations and helps to make them safer as well. So that's been um, a really interesting part of doing this coalition work is getting to really hear from bus, bus operators themselves about why this is important to them. Um, I want to get to another question. I was in, I was looking at the chat. We uh, have the, uh, the the chair of the Annapolis Transportation Board who uh, mentioned that they are trying to get seven percent of the the city. I guess presumably the city of Annapolis to cover the seven the seven percent of uh, of revenues. Um, then that is seven uh, percent. I want to get this right because it's important. 7% of revenues to that transportation system come solely from fares, just 7%. And they want the city of Annapolis to cover that cost. Um, the question I'd like to ask to you, Jane, is this, um, from Cheryl Gross Glad, oh wait, no, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you guys. Uh, how much role improvements could be avoided? Ew, wait, I'm so sorry. I'm gonna jump to another question. I wanna mention to folks, we ran over a bit over time with presentations and I will do my work to get some of these questions answered because they're really good questions. But the question I wanna to get to you, Jane, is can you comment on fare free versus quality of transit? And this is from Cheryl Gross Glasser. She says, I once interviewed the director of a fare free system and he maintained that the lousy fare free transit is still lousy transit. Is there still a commitment among, uh, commitment among, uh, I'm miss, uh, I think there's, a typo. Is there a commitment among uh, to improving transit frequency on top of when it depends? And that question is to you, Jay. Yes, absolutely. Easy one to answer. Um, I think that is completely right. A bus that comes very infrequently and is not reliable, is not super helpful, even if it's free. Um, and that's why for a long time, I was a person who uh, did not think that it was worth focusing on free fares at all. And I personally have changed my mind on this issue. Um, I think when we're prioritizing things, it's still going to be the most important to prioritize frequency and reliability. Um, but I also think that transit advocates and agencies need to think in the long term. And in the long term, we need to get out of an austerity mindset. And if we're going to get the mode shift that we need to combat climate change and to meet these equity goals that we all have to support economic development, then we need to do everything that we can and use all the policy levers that we have to get people on the bus. Um, and so that's why that last point that I spoke to in my presentation, understanding that we do live in a resource constrained environment um, right now in the short term, we still overall want permanently free fares, but for now we're pushing to at least extend them until this ride on reimagined study is complete. And then we can make that prioritization judgment essentially. Julie, um, I, I wanna give you an answer to, I wanna give you the final uh, uh, question and to that final answer to that question. You, you, know, you talked about you all's first step really is the network redesign. Um, do you, can you like share any insights that you have on this fare free versus quality? Yeah, when I first got here, that was a, a big debate because we were looking at doing a fare system restructure when we when I first got here, and that was pre-COVID. Uh, when COVID hit and we went zero fare, I think nobody argued with it. The safety issue of keeping people separated was a, a no-brainer. Um, as we move forward, people said, "Well, put fares back so you can expand service." Honestly, I don't have the operators. I don't. <sighs> Uh, someone's going to quote me on this later. I don't care how much money you give me today. I can't expand service. I don't have the operators. But what I can do that will make service better for everyone is keep it healthier and safer for zero fares. And as I'm recruiting and as I'm putting service back in play and rebuilding, rebuilding based on a zero fare network and expanding is absolutely goal. And we'll be able to make prioritized expansions to serve our community better when we have that model in place. 
Thank you so much, brother. And there are so many interconnected issues, particularly this time as we hopefully are coming out of this pandemic. I really want to. I'm going to make sure that we do the work to answer some of the audience questions, questions that we didn't get to. Um, and I want to end on this and some important point about our transit workers that both uh, uh, Julie uh, just mentioned, Jane mentioned, and uh, Chris mentioned, um, and talking about fair evasion criminalization. Before, prior to the event, yeah, prior to the pandemic, we heard these st awful stories about, particularly bus operators, um, being. Uh, harass and attack, and these conflicts over fares are at the center of it. But it's important, this conversation about fare elimination and reduction, uh, and all these other points, when they get to all the questions, are so, so important. And as I always say um, during this pandemic, the world that we lived in before is still the exact same world that we live in today. But as we've seen, for, particularly for transit, uh, the expansion of fare-free rides, uh, of, of fare-free transit systems, or fares being reduced across the country and throughout our region, uh, we can do better. I think I'm uh, uh, borrowing maybe a CSGs uh, of someone, I'm borrowing as better as possible, better as possible. And uh, I want to thank our panelists, I want to thank all of our attendees. Um, there's so much to discuss, and we're going to do a, 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 our best to get you some answers. Um, and I hope we're able to do another event about this and maybe talk more about all the great things happening in Richmond, Montgomery County, and DC. Um, and I hope everyone has a really good, uh, with this, uh, this webinar has been recorded. We'll be uploaded to uh, Gigi Wash's YouTube, so you can find it there. Um, and a follow-up post with answers to the questions that we didn't get to today. I want to say thank you to G uh, Julie Tim, CEO of GRTC, Jane Lyons, Ma Maryland Advocacy Manager, uh, at Coalition for Smarter Growth, and Chris Laskowski, uh, Legislative Director for Ward 6 DC Council Member, uh, Charles Allen. Thank you all, and thank you for uh, my first webinar in two years uh, of being at GG Wash. So we got some of the jitters out, but thank you all, and have a good rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. Have a great day.